very much from the bottom of my heart for that incredible introduction and deep introduction. Indeed, I feel that really I have nothing more to say because it's already said. <laughs> sure you will understand and appreciate that in a talk of this nature there could be some points, even some important ones, which I may miss out without realizing it, for which please excuse me. But there will be a Q&A at the end and please do feel free to pick up on any points then. Babuji was born on 15 September 1904 in Dabasang in Gujarat with about a thousand inhabitants. Remarkably, he was a teacher in his village school from the age of 11, and in 1919, at the age of only 15, he got an opportunity of going to Kenya. After a couple of years working as a shop assistant, during which time he was taught bookkeeping, in 1922, he set up his first business in Nairobi. This business involved the purchase of large drums of Vaseline, which he put in small jars. He then cycled to other towns to sell them. Over the next 30 years, he was involved with various businesses in wholesaling, manufacturing, and financial services. My father retired from his business career in December 1953 at the age of 49 by which time he had started, bought, and sold 50 businesses, and he had succeeded in life way beyond the dreams of the 15-year-old boy who had stepped ashore in Africa 34 years prior. 3,000 Africans, 125 Indians, and many Europeans were employed across the group, and he had won their respect and loyalty. He had raised his family from abject poverty to wealth and he had become a powerful industrialist and financier. Given this, it took considerable courage to step down from his business career at his peak, but he was determined to do so. He was still a relatively young man, not even 50, but he did not see retirement as a move to an idle life but as a call to serve humanity in a different way. I would now like to share something about Ba. Although the thrust of this talk is about Bapuji's influence on me, it would be apposite to talk about Ba. Ba was a pillar of strength to Bapuji. Indeed, an astrologer had said that Bapuji's wealth was written in Ba's palm. I reflected Babaji. Of course, not in an overt way, because that would have been deemed inappropriate in that era. But she acted as a silent sounding board for Babaji's thinking, which helped him hone his plans. Further, she acted as a sponge and absorbed everything that Babaji said to her over a game of cards early every morning, which he invariably lost. She then stored all that information and guidance, which she passed on to my brother Vipin and me. <coughs> Till Ba passed away in 2003, we would very often turn to her for her counsel, and she would recall and tell us what Babuji would have done in a similar set of circumstances. Babuji named many institutions after Ba, 
For example, the MM Shah Nursery and Primary Schools in Kisumu, and the MM Shah and MV Shah Academy in Mombasa, which some of you will be familiar with. As I said, Babuji got involved in business at a very young age. But as is traditional with Jains, he was determined to give back to the community as soon as possible. So in 1928, at the age of only 24, he donated funds for the construction of a school in his home village in India, Tabasan, from where, where he had come virtually penniless only nine years previously. His philanthropy became his hallmark. Whilst he was engaged in developing businesses, he was also involved in fundraising for charitable causes. In the 1930s, he raised funds for the drought in Jamnagar, and he was treasurer of the Saurashtra Famine Committee. His charitable activity continued in the 1940s, for example, raising funds for the Bengal Famine Relief relief and other worthy causes. In 1948, Papuji was traveling to Mumbai and during the flight, the plane went through some sudden and unexpected turbulence to the great alarm of the passengers. The plane eventually landed safely, but Papuji was a little shaken by the experience. It was not so much the fear of a crash and death but the sudden realization that if his life were to end then, he would leave a great fortune in monetary terms, but he would die owing a spiritual debt. <clears throat> he began to prepare a different kind of balance sheet, one of his life. Papuji felt strongly that when a person dies, they cannot take earthly wealth with them, but what we do take is karma, the results of our deeds good and bad. He believed that if someone postpones good deeds of charity to old age and engages himself solely in the acquisition of wealth, they cannot be said to have lived a successful life. He knew that life is transient and it, if it ends in a sudden plane crash, wealth is worth nothing. So after that flight, he made a decision to do something before it was too late. Amassing a fortune, of course, was a great achievement, but Babuji was made of different stuff. Although up until this point in his life had been meritorious in that he had brought employment and prosperity to many, but alongside his businesses, he had donated and fundraised for many worthy causes. However, he was never tempted to sit on his fortune and enjoy a life of luxury. Learning from his own struggles, he developed a deep sensitivity about the problems of poverty in the country of his birth and in Kenya. He stopped thinking of earning more money for himself and the family and decided to dedicate his whole life to the service of the cause of suffering humanity. After discussing his decision with my mother, who gave her full blessing, Babuji began to make plans and organizing his business affairs. In 1948, the Mechibai Foundation had been set up with an initial sum of one million shillings. And from 1953, Babuji, when he was not even 50, was able to focus his time, effort, and money to giving back to society. There were two main reasons why Babuji took such a strong interest in philanthropy. First, as a Jain, Babuji believed in the principle of Urparikra and limited his possessions to what was needed for the family and putting the rest to better use. Second, there was a natural sense of giving back to the communities from where he had come and where he had built his businesses. He went to India and got in touch with the government of what was then known as Saurashtra, formerly Katyavar. Saurashtra was a backward state, and there were very few primary schools or village dispensaries, and certainly not hospitals and colleges. He was a very shrewd man. All his donations had one thing in common, namely that for every rupee he gave, relief worth three rupees was insured for the public, because he insisted 
that the state government should supply one rupee and the local public and or central government the third rupee. He knew the importance of getting buy-in from the key constituencies and that without a financial commitment that buy-in would be superficial. The old adage of people don't value what they don't pay for. Also, the government had to undertake to permanently maintain and develop these institutions. This was a masterstroke, as it relieved him of the running of the institutions. Out of all the institutions that Babaji funded, only one is actually closed. Likewise, in East Africa, there was hardly a publicly funded school or hospital in Kenya to which he had not made a contribution. He helped African students to go abroad for higher education, providing many scholarships. Many institutions also benefited, including the Social Service League, which was able to buy the Parkland's nursing home in Nairobi, which later became the MP Shah Hospital. These photos of Vipin and Jaya, our sister, were taken with President Jomo Kenyatta and Tom Boya at the time of the donation. Between the years of 1953 and 1964, my father built more than 100 hospitals, clinics, colleges, schools and hostels, mainly in Gujarat and Kenya. Amongst the various institutions that he founded, the medical college in Jamnagar, the cancer hospital in Ahmedabad, and the hospital in Nairobi are prominent, are still fully operational today and have grown beyond measure. As in business, Papuji had great foresight in the realm of charitable giving. For example, in Jamnagar, he bought and donated land to the municipality. 20 acres were purchased in the inner suburb for the MP Shah Education Complex. This land is today worth 500 crore rupees. Similarly, he purchased 60 acres on the outskirts for the MP Shah Udyognagar. This land is today's Today's value is rupees 750 crores. Papaji was recognized in various ways. Prime Minister Nehru visited our house in Jamnagar. As you will see from these remarkable photos, he was accompanied by two future Prime Ministers, Muraji Vaidesai and Indira Gandhi. Quite some time after, in Aradhanam, a copy of Papaji's biography was given to Rajiv Gandhi when he was accompanied by his wife, Sonia. Papaji was nominated to the Rajya Sabha, and he and Ba spent some time in New Delhi. You will not be surprised to hear that he could not understand the politician's maneuvering and resigned just before he came to London in 1957. He was a man who liked to speak little and do much. He found the opposite amongst the politicians. <laughs> in other places all over the world. Uh, much more recently, the Jamaica Municipal Commission recognized his contribution to the city and renamed the Satrasta Circle as MP Shah Circle, and the road leading to it has been named MP Shah Mark. Until his untimely death in 1964, at the young age of 59, Babaji worked as hard on his philanthropic work as he had done in his business life. He has left us a very strong legacy which, as a family, we have treasured and honored to this day. Up after Babaji passed away, the family has continued the philanthropic work started by him, and our focus still remains the support of educational and healthcare institutions in Gujarat and Kenya, and now in the British Isles. Given our fundamental principles of our Parikara, and that we should give back to the community in the places where we, are, we have earned money. We have supported the Hammersmith Hospital, where we funded various projects, including the Megraj Basic Cardiovascular Laboratories, which were opened by Prince Charles, and Jane Samaj in Leicester, the Jersey Museum, and various charities in London, including OE UK. Given the fact that many of the institutions that Babaji founded are now well over 60 years old. Much of the family's recent charitable giving has been directed to renovate, rebuild, and enhance the institutions 
which Babaji originally helped to build. For example, the town hall in Jamnagar and 50 primary schools in Jamnagar district. We have used a standard model for the schools as per the third. They've been met Narendra Bhai Modi, the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, to hand him our letter of commitment for this rebuilding project. As time has passed, we have moved on from pure charitable giving. Members of the family are now actively involved in venture philanthropy, whereby we utilize our experience, time and contacts to assist with charitable causes and organizations. This concept involves the transfer and application of business skills to the charitable domain to create a long-term, sustainable and measurable impact. Many of the family participate in venture philanthropy and are advisors or trustees to a number of charities in India, East Africa and the UK. For example, Vipin assists a charity in Jersey where he lives, which has built an orphanage just outside Nairobi. I had my calling in 1998 when, like Babaji, I turned 50. I work with about a dozen charities, which are either local, national, or international, where I act as a trustee or advisor. Some examples are Brooke, which works in the developing countries with families which own working donkeys, horses, and mules. I partner India, which links donors in the UK with projects in India. Animal Helpline in Jamnagar, where our vets have treated over 50,000 animals since its inception five years ago. Trees for Cities, which helps with the greening of 20 cities in the UK, and also in Nairobi and Kigali. Citizens Advice Enfield, which has opened my eyes to the plight of people in this very town in which we live. Global Giving, which is an internet-based crowdfunder. I recently agreed to join the board of the UK affiliate of a German charity called ProVeg, which is a food awareness organization with the mission to reduce global animal consumption by 50% by the year 2040. A project which excites me is one which has actually taken the longest to gain traction. About 10 years ago, we put a proposal to the Jamnaga Municipal Corporation to improve the conditions of the street dogs of Jamnaga, whose pitiful state many of you will have seen. I'm pleased to say that, having received at long last approval from the JMC, yes, it does take a long time to cut through bureaucracy in India. This project has just commenced with Humane Society International of the USA. Over a period of two years, the plan is to educate the people to ensure a peaceful and harmonious coexistence between humans and canines by creating defined friendly neighborhoods for dogs. I'm a firm proponent of the concept of one welfare, which stresses the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and the environment, which is so much in line with the Jain view of the world. We are delighted that the next generation is continuing with their grandfather's legacy and have become involved in charitable works in their own right. Vipin Sun Binoy, until recently, was a trustee of Business Bridge, a charity which teaches business skills to micro entrepreneurs in Africa and India. Vipin's daughter Vaishali was a trustee of Find Your Feet, which helps women in East Africa and India to create sustainable livelihoods. My daughter-in-law, Sono, is applying to become a trustee of Actuaries Without Borders. My son, Anish, has actually gone a step further and is directly involved in the sector full-time as he heads a mental health charity called Bowhaven, which is situated in Tower Hamlets. More recently, we have recognized the worth of impact investing, which focuses on sustainable development and have supported such projects. For example, SOCO is an organization that assists 
women in the rural areas of Kenya to make handicrafts, which are then sold through an online platform set up by Soko, which gives them access to buyers internationally. Access Afia sets up many clinics throughout Kenya, where the cost of diagnosis and medication is kept to a bare minimum. Avishkar is a fund in India, which helps small businesses. For example, it has invested in a business which manufactures weighing scales, which dairy farmers now use to weigh the milk before they send it to the local cooperative, where previously they had no say and had, and had to accept whatever the cooperative manager stated was the weight. So it's clear that our father's legacy has been perpetuated. It has been extremely gratifying to note that many of the institutions that we have founded have received tremendous financial support from other donors. Many of you know the MP Shah Hospital and we have seen the enormous development that has taken place there. Then look at the MP Shah Medical College. Babuji donated 15 lakh rupees 60 years ago to commence the college. And a couple of years ago, the government of Gujarat donated 110 crore rupees to construct an additional building. The MP Shah Cancer Hospital was started with one building. The government has built 16 more on this site to make it one of the largest in India. The Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan in London was started with our donation in 1972. Many of you will have visited the Mount Batina Auditorium at the Bhavan. Actually, this was meant to be called the Megraj Auditorium. But the Bhavan's committee requested that, in the light of the connections between the UK and India, we should call it the Mountbatten Auditorium, to which, of course, we readily agree. The Manivan M.P. Shah Women's College in Mumbai is now supported by the local community. It is a significant institution and has over 6,000 female students. The MP Shah All India Talking Book Center in Mumbai was deemed to be of such significance for the nation that it was inaugurated by the President of India, Zail Singh. I mentioned earlier the Jain tenet of Obarika. To me, this is a powerful tool to be employed in business. I remember at college we were taught about profit maximization. But one of the professors also explained the principle of satisficing. Put simply, this means earn, but let others also earn. I find this principle has a powerful connection with Parigra, and it is one we have used in our businesses. By all means, charge fees or interest for a service, but do not be extortionate. So what are the lessons that we have learned in relation, in relation to philanthropy? There's a Christian saying, it is not a sin to be rich, but it is a sin to die rich. There's nothing wrong in profit, but there has to be a purpose to utilize it in the service of others. Effective altruism is something that we should all endeavor to practice. Many people believe that altruism should necessarily denote sacrifice, but actually doing good while maintaining a comfortable life is entirely possible. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Indeed, altruism itself, as long as it is in the context of something you are passionate about and believe, significantly enhances one's quality of life. Bill and Melinda Gates have a saying, the chance to make a difference is not just someday, it is now and today. One can give back in any shape or form. Timely service, like timely gifts, is doubled in value. When I have time, I ask to help a charity. I guess I suffer from OCD, Occupational Charity Disorder. <laughs> we have taught my grandsons Dylan and Devon the virtues of sharing their toys by using the catchphrase, sharing is caring. I firmly believe this is fully applicable to philanthropy. Throughout the journey the family has taken from India to East Africa and to the UK, Babuji's principles of philanthropy have as always remained in our heart. The family's values on philanthropy can be summarized in the quote that Sandeepai mentioned, 
by Stephen Grellet, and if you don't mind, I'll repeat it. I shall pass through this world but once. If therefore there be any kindness I can show or any good thing I can do, let me do it now. Let me not defer it nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Thank you.